everyone, welcome to a special episode of A Different Atheist Reads, A History of God by Karen Armstrong. I'm Christy Winters and I'm going to be doing a two-parter on this chapter 4 section because I want to do a separate video on religious patriarchy and why it sucks. And then I'm going to do a second part which is going to just wrap up chapter 4. But for those of you who aren't here for the book series but are interested in the topic, let's go. In The History of God, Karen has touched infrequently upon the problems of the status of women and the roles of women, not giving a historically accurate view of women's position in society and in religion. And so, since she brought it up here in Chapter 4, I thought I would use this opportunity to talk more broadly about my feminist critique of patriarchy, and in particular my atheist critique of religious patriarchy, and why it sucks how it sucks, and the alternative, which is egalitarianism. In this video, I want to go over a few things. First, I want to define what is patriarchy. Then I wanted to introduce some concepts, including the ideas of structure and agency, the public and the private spheres, the basis of patriarchy and how religion sustains it. Then I want to look at the secular alternative to religious patriarchy, which is egalitarianism. And finally, I want to just look at how we can see modern manifestations of religious patriarchy in our own society with ideas like toxic masculinity and toxic femininity. A pretty quick and easy definition of patriarchy is a social system in which males hold primary power, where men predominate roles of political leadership, moral authority, social privilege, and control of property, and they also have domination in the family in, in terms of father figures holding authority over women and children. But we, what I want to focus on here is the way in which economic, social, and political power are concentrated in the hands of men for, because they are men, for no other reason than they have a penis and women don't, and children are considered not capable of making decisions, and so they're also the property of men. A very honest and serious critique of this is that it's not a racial, rational basis for governing a society. There's no intellectual defense of patriarchy. There's nothing about the penis that gives it special qualities of insights or gives people special powers or anything like that. It's an arbitrary rule with no rational basis in terms of justification of power. Because it has no rational basis, it has to use irrational measures, in particular violence or the threat of violence, to perpetuate itself. Another characteristic of patriarchy is that it defines women pretty much by their sexuality in terms of how women relate to men. Human, women aren't human beings in their own right. They uh, only have value and worth insofar as they have use or are, can, are the property of men. Although archaeologists and um, anthropologists are unclear as to when patriarchy actually started, we do have evidence for it found in the ancient Near East as far back as 3100 before the Common Era. And we also have seen in this own series of A History of God that with the appearance of the Hebrews there is an exclusion of the woman from the God-Humanity Covenant. And we saw before that women really don't exist as legal people, the texts aren't even addressed to women, women uh, only interact with Yahweh when it comes to childbearing or to be reprimanded by him, and so basically women's humanity does not exist in those texts. The reason why I want to talk about the concepts of structure and agency is because we have to, I think, to understand patriarchy, understand how it's reproduced. So in the social sciences, we look at the role of social structures and individuals within those structures. So a structure is a recurrent pattern or norm or value that exists within a society and, according to the definition, it influences or limits the choices or opportunities available to individuals in that society. Now, agency is the capacity for individuals to act independently and to make their own free choices. So in the structure and agency debate, you can understand it as sort of socialization versus autonomy in terms of how free people are to act within societies and to what extent do they then influence the structures of, that they operate within. If we think about it in terms of patriarchy, really for uh, all of human society, we've inherited a patriarchal structure. That is our legacy from the past. 
Now, individuals within a patriarchal structure can choose to either reproduce the same norms and values and structures they themselves were born into, or you can agitate and change them, transform them. And a clear and very obvious example of this in a lot of, a lot of places around the world is marriage equality. That previously we had social structures that denied marriage equality to people, and individuals are agitating, recognizing the inequality in those structures, and then taking limit legal remedies in order to alter the structures to better reflect our values. If we think about the way power is structured in patriarchy, basically men are at the top, and then they rule over everybody else. Women, as adults, might have authority over children, but basically all authority really rests in or comes from the male, and of course if the woman exercises authority, a man can overrule her, but vice versa is not the case. What are the underlying principles of patriarchy? Well, one is essentialism. And essentialism is the view that for any specific entity, be that a person or a group of people or something, there is a set of attributes which are necessary to its identity. And in terms of essentialism and society or politics, we can reject essentialism because basically it's a terrible theory. Um, the idea that people are inherently something, women will are inherently this, therefore they will do this, that, is uh, it's not an explanatory theory at all. You can't make very good predictions based on essentialist claims. But patriarchy rests on the essential assertion that power is vested in the males, in the penis, um, and in male uh, domination. That's where power appropriately lies, whereas women are inherently unqualified or unworthy over that kind of power. They are to be excluded from those circles and those having that kind of influence because they do not possess a penis. And a perfect example of this is ordination. The, all the religions that reject women simply because they are women, as if being a woman makes her defective on her face. That should be at face value not on her face, like, you know, egg on her face or something, but like at face value. They, if she walks in the door and she doesn't have a penis, she can't be a priest because she's lacking something inherently. There's something missing in her, just to clarify. If there was evidence for essentialism as an explanatory theory, then I would be open to it. But having investigated sexual stereotypes and gender roles and gender attributes, there's really no evidence. So essentialism is a form of very sloppy thinking. It's sloppy and it's lazy. In contrast to essentialism, we can take up the position of social construction, the idea that we, um, are, we can, can, our identities are constructed by perhaps our preferences, but also the structures in which we find ourselves. And a way to sum this up is um, Simone de Beauvoir's comment that one is not born but becomes a woman. You might be born female, but in order to be a woman, that is a socialization process. In terms of how patriarchy operates, I want to bring in the ideas from feminism of the public and the private sphere. Now, the public sphere is the area in social life where individuals can come together and freely discuss and identify social problems, and through that, engage in some kind of action, maybe political action or otherwise. The private sphere is where people can act without government inter interference or influence, and that is usually taken to mean the home and the family. So we basically have you know, public spaces, public institution, public roles, and then the private sphere, those are the roles within the household and within the family. Patriarchy assigns males power both in the public and the private sphere regardless of his qualifications or regardless of any other abilities or lack of abilities that he might have. Patriarchy further eliminates women from the public sphere option entirely. Women are limited by patriarchy to the private sphere. In other words, they might be given some kind of domestic responsibilities, but those are assigned by the man and she's not allowed in a patriarchy to come outside of the home and act as an independent agent. Private sphere concerns by not having government interference, patriarchy then um, allows things such as marital rape, uh, domestic abuse, child abuse, these kinds of things are seen, or honor killings, these kinds of things are seen as private matters and not something that the government should be interfering with. The man's ability to rule his house is seen as his prerogative and not something that the government should be interfering with. Again, under this system, women are defined really in terms of how they relate to the men in their lives. And that might be sisters, wives, daughters. It can also be mistresses and prostitutes. 
because patriarchy also rests in the sort of the phallus and the idea of the penis as supreme, it therefore has contempt for the penetrated. It has contempt for women in that way because women are to be penetrated, women do not penetrate. And in that way it sows the seeds for homophobia as well because the idea of two men engaging in a penetrative act must always include one person being dominant and one person being submissive. And because it cannot stand alone, it must mirror the sex act between the men and the women. And women, of course, are always penetrated because they are the subject, they are the subjugated. And so patriarchy is inherently uh, homophobic. Because patriarchy denies women their dignity and it views their only value in terms of their sexuality, it's very easy to go from a patriarchal worldview into a misogynistic one. This can be manifested in numerous ways, including sexual discrimination, uh, denigrating women, violence against women, and sexually objectifying women. Now, in addition to violence, societies have used religion to enhance and sustain the patriarchal structures that give men rights over women. Yahweh is always depicted in the masculine sense. He is therefore other to women. He is unlike women and more like men, which again brings contempt and distance to women in terms of the entire gender of the whole population. In the biblical text, um, Yahweh ordains the patriarchal structure as the divine order, thereby removing the ability of women and men to question its fundamental unfairness or its reliance on violence in order to perpetuate itself. Women are defined through the creation story as men's helpers, not as equal human beings. And therefore, because they're there to help men and serve men, there's religious justification for confining women to the home. And in the biblical text, women are treated just as poorly by Yahweh as by the men in their lives. So the God of the Bible provides no good example of how to treat women respectfully or how to be an egalitarian, how to engage with a woman as a person. If you want to watch my video series, G-O-D or O-B-G-Y-N, I review some of the texts that demonstrate that basically women have a non-existent, they're not real human beings with equal contributions, character development, or value in the biblical texts. The most radical and also the most powerful challenge to patriarchy is the concept of egalitarianism. While the Bible might hint at spiritual egalitarianism, and that basically means men and women can end up at the same place, it has no interest in providing for egalitarianism or women's rights during this lifetime. Egalitarianism in the Bible must wait until after you're dead. So submit now and you'll be rewarded after you die. In contrast, egalitarianism holds that all human beings have the same fundamental rights, dignity, and value. And the form of equality of persons in rights, in regards to their rights, is sometimes referred to as natural rights, and John Locke is often attributed as the author of this idea. Although when you look it up, egalitarianism isn't something that they can give you a specific date on, although it certainly is something that seems to be enlightenment-led, which makes sense. In contrast to the top-down power structure of patriarchy, egalitarianism basically has two levels where you have adults on one level, children on the other, and of course as children become adults they are able to enter into the same rights and obligations that all other adult members of society enjoy. So in egalitarianism, women and men have equal rights, dignity, in both the public and the private spheres, and children are covered under legal protections, the same kinds of legal protections that adults give, but they acquire greater responsibilities and rights with age. The characteristics of egalitarianism which distinguish it from patriarchy is that human rights are not linked to your sex organs. The idea of violence in order to pr promote or to maintain a power structure actually violates the basic principle of egalitarianism. Egalitarianism, as I said, applies both to the public and private sphere. There's no reason why once you walk into your house you lose all your rights and dignity. Therefore, there should be equality in and outside of the household. And finally, uh, Egalitarianism, in order to be valid, has to include all the members of society. So in conclusion, monotheism is certain, just not compatible with human equality. There's just no religious system out there that, um, well, at least monotheistically, that actually has um, achieved or even could biblically teach the concept of egalitarianism in this life. The idea that women are of equal value worth and have equal rights to men is actually a massive threat to the Bible because it undermines and overturns its entire basis of power structures and its entire history of what the divine order is and what God meant for human beings to do. We see 
the vestiges of this sort of religious patriarchy in modern society, even as our legal structures are becoming more and more egalitarian, in our society we still see a lot of the values of patriarchy being used to counter and fight against those who are pushing for an egalitarian um, value system for our societies. In particular, we can look at the concept of toxic masculinity, which narrowly defines men in a way that mirrors the, the, patriarchal, the religious patriarchal values, that the things that uh, are okay for men to do are to be engaging in violence and to use force and violence um, as ways of providing um, power over others. And I can think right now of um, people who are calling for the bombing of Iran as a solution to them getting nuclear weapons. This mindless violence is, is acceptable um, as a form of how men deal with problems. You bomb the hell out of them and that's a solution. Men are expected to be unemotional, except when they're showing perhaps anger, which is of course linked to violence and therefore justified. But um, ideas of men crying or breaking down, those kinds of things men are judged more harshly for because that is seen as going against what a strong ruler in a patriarchal sense uh, would look like. Men in this, the patriarchal worldview are meant to be sexually aggressive and promiscuous. And so these kinds of behaviors are tolerated if not encouraged or supported or validated by other men. And this, um, obviously, if, if you're looking at women just as things to be used sexually, you're gonna have a hard time forming decent relationships in your romantic life. So these things are obviously pressures that young boys and men face today. There are ways in which patriarchy can find them into small boxes of what isn't, isn't acceptable for men to do. And the things that it's encouraging them to do are not really healthy. <laughs> um, you know, the use of violence, the suppression of emotions, the uh, sexual object, ah, the sexual objectification of your romantic partner or seeing women generally as things to be conquered all lead to alienation and really not a healthy mental state. I would also say that there are currently notions of toxic femininity as well. And in particular, we um, would I would say that those norms that encourage women to be passive. You know, when Michelle Bachman was at, you know, asked about her role of her president, that she would submit to her husband in marriage, but not as president of the United States, this obsession, this, um, this expectation that she should be submissive, that she should uh, always let her husband make the choices and then just swallow whatever she thinks is best, just swallow her pride, swallow her opinions, stuff it all down and obey, is certainly not healthy to relationships and to your sense of self-worth and also just, you know, getting your life in order. You know, there's, there's no reason why someone, because she has a uterus, must always obey. There are also very toxic notions of women's sexual purity that women, of course, um, you know, virginity is much more important for girls than it is for boys. And women are basically have two lines. They're either virgins or sluts. I see purity balls as an example of toxic femininity. Purity balls just creep me out. Father, daughter, chastity ball, balls, or any of those kinds of things where girls are encouraged to take a virginity pledge and dress up um, and go out dancing with their fathers. Just that's, that's freaking weird to me, and that's definitely toxic and puts ideas in, in girls' heads about their dads and their, their worth to men being linked again to their hymen and not to who they are as people. And there's also, uh, I think, a toxic notion of self-negation, that women, the ultimate thing for a woman to do is to be a wife and a mother, and that means being there for her husband and being there for her child, as if she herself it does not exist, that she only lives to serve. Uh, maybe it's her employer and her children and her husband, and so she's always giving, giving, as if she has an endless well of energy and love and resources, and she never needs anything for herself. I think those, that is very harmful for women to continually negate their own um, needs and always elevate somebody else's needs. There has to be more balance, and egalitarianism allows for that. So we can see that where we have critics of feminism, we also see often the use of language that is intended to belittle or demean advocates of equality by using these tropes, by relying on religious patriarchy in order to try to put us back in our place. So when 
uh, women like myself, when I even mention that I have a death threat and I make a video about getting a death threat, I'm complaining. Just mention the fact that it happened and doing a video on it. I'm now unreasonable uh, for complaining. I'm a damsel in distress and I'm crying out for help. Alternatively, men who support equal rights and egalitarian values are belittled by be call being called white knights, that they have to go in and have the aggressive, violent, sexualized notion of saving the princess and rescuing her so he can get, uh, get his end away. That's the only reason why men would want to advocate equality. So we can see that these religious patriarchal norms are still at use even in secular societies and secular circles in order to diminish and degrade people who want to try to elevate men and women's status as being equal and to make sure that the opportunities that are available are available equally to all. The use of dox, doxing threats, rape threats, and death threats that are of course disproportionately targeted at women are another reflection of religious patriarchy the idea that you can use violent or violence or the threat of violence in order to silence women if you just threaten to rape her then she'll shut up and you won't have to hear the complaint the criticisms that she has or she you won't have to deal with the fact that she is being oppressed that you make your life easier that somehow your use of violence to in order to silence someone from even say, speaking is justified that comes right out of religious patriarchy so we all knew that religious patriarchy sucks but i wanted to spend a little time explaining what i think is pathological about it what i think the antidote to it is, and if you're interested in learning more about how monotheism ties into misogyny and patriarchy, then the best website I found is called Pascal's Wager, and he's got, uh, it's actually like almost a decade or more old now, but I yet have yet to see a better website that documents the hatred of women that was is found in the Bible and in later Christian writings. So one of the Websites is entitled The Position of Women, The Teachings of the Theologians. The other is The Positions of Women, the Bible. And I'll put links to both of those websites in the D-Box below. So if you're just here to uh, learn about what religious patriarchy is and why it sucks, thank you so much for your time and attention. I appreciate that you stopped by. And for those of you who are following in my History of God series, I'm going to be doing the next video where we're going to talk a little bit about Karen being a mystic, about... Um, Augustine, I think I said Aquinas last time, I meant Augustine, and then I'm going to compare the attributes of Yahweh and the God of the Trinity that we find by the end of chapter 4. So until part 2 or next time, I've been Christy, you've been awesome, and I'll see you guys later on. Bye.